The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, I'm Thomas Salerno, and you're listening to The Secrets of Oppenheimer, where we'll be discussing the hidden themes and deeper layers found in director Christopher Nolan's latest historical thriller, a biopic of J. Robert Oppenheimer, the so-called father of the atomic bomb. And joining me today on the panel are Patrick Mason. Hello, Patrick. Howdy, Tom. And Jason Yuji. Hello, Jason. Hi, guys. Glad to be here. And be sure to follow The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or your podcast app of choice. And please do us a favor by sharing the podcast with your friends, because I know we've got a lot of great movies and shows to discuss on the podcast in future months. So be sure to stay tuned. And you can follow the show on social media. We're at Facebook.com slash StarQuest Media or on the social media platform formerly known as Twitter, where we are at SQPN (laughs) or on Instagram, where we are at StarQuest Network. To let everybody know beforehand, we are going to spoil this film. And I know some of you are probably thinking, spoilers? What spoilers? Oppenheimer builds the A-bomb, the end. But the movie, <laughs> the movie is actually a lot more complicated than that. And to really yeah. enjoy this film in full, there are certain spoilers you should not know going into the movie. Unless, of course, you're a huge history buff and you already know all the details of Oppenheimer's life and career already. But seriously, if you haven't been spoiled yet, see the film and then come back and listen to our analysis. And since Christopher Nolan, as usual, has decided to narrate the events of his film out of order, I am not going to attempt a detailed plot recap. In fact, I think it's just best to let our discussion play out. But what I will say is J. Robert Oppenheimer was a renowned 20th century physicist. He knew such luminaries as Niels Bohr, Albert Einstein, and Werner Heisenberg, among others. He is considered the father of the A-bomb because he played a key role in America's Manhattan Project to develop the first nuclear weapons during World War II. But after the war, he ran afoul of certain U.S. government officials during the Red Scare because of his former ties to members of the Communist Party, his advocacy for international cooperation to prevent nuclear proliferation, and his opposition to the development of the more powerful hydrogen bomb. And the movie revolves around a contrived closed-door hearing designed to strip Oppenheimer of his government security clearance. So I guess the first thing I'll ask is, did either did either a lot about Oppenheimer's bio before going into this movie? So yeah, because you, you yeah. are the nuclear engineer, so <laughs> yeah, I, I so. want to hear from you on this As a, topic. Yeah. I absolutely loved how they started it. And, of course, it's based on the, the novel, the biography about him, which is called American Prometheus. If you wow. haven't, if you don't want to go see the movie, but you want to listen to this podcast, and you'd like to get the details in a different way, in book form, American Prometheus is the primary source material used by Nolan for this movie. That was pretty cool because the author got a special private screening in New York with the director. Um, oh, nice. A couple other people. Yeah. And he, it was very well done. Like it, it was so well done that he, it brought him to tears. Like it, and there were certain things of course that didn't happen that, that Nolan took license with, but he did it in such a way that it was still true to the characters or to the people. As a nuclear engineer, you build this pantheon of, gods yeah. in the mathematics and the physics in the nuclear world and you get to see most of them over the course of this movie uh, and it's all people you know, I remember I had one instructor who used to call them old dead white guys <laughs> Euler and Niels Bohr and obviously Einstein and Oppenheimer and Fermi and you have all the things basically any name that's attached to a mathematical formula a lot of those guys are around in the same time frame, especially the high level physics stuff, Heisenberg. And but Oppenheimer isn't really he doesn't have his own like formulas, right? It's no like necessarily Oppenheimer equation that I'm going to go grab. One of Oppenheimer's greatest kind of achievement or ability was his ability to bring people together and to make things work. 
And in a lot of ways, that made him very much like the god Prometheus. And so picking that name for Oppenheimer, it comes from the book, American Prometheus, but he was all, he was all, he's always viewed as that kind of, that's his mythos. Legendary people always have a mythos that's built around him, and that's his mythos. There were a lot of guys in that time frame who were very questionable about the use of atomics and atomic physics for the purpose of weaponry. And we're, yeah, we might help with the project or no, we're not going to help with the project or this is not for us. And Einstein was big on that part. And Oppenheimer was like the God that was like, no, I'm going to take the fire and I'm going to give it to the humans and we'll let right. them do what yeah. they want with it. To me, that's like when they start off with the quote about Prometheus, I'm like, aha, <laughs> I think they probably nailed this. <laughs> Jason, did, did, did you know much about Oppenheimer going in? I learned so much more in that movie than I ever knew. I knew enough. I'm a nerd. So I knew, I know that he made the bomb. He, Los Alamos was his thing. He picked, I knew that he'd picked New Mexico to do all that. I knew some of the military stuff that, you know, that everybody knows about that. Like your intro, Oppenheimer made the bomb the end yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to see how it was done and, and that's mm-hmm. why I was so excited for the movie months ago I think we were talking about it a couple months ago about doing this podcast even before a couple months before the movie came out being the nerd I wanted to see how it all played out and it was much more intriguing than than all you ever heard about Oppenheimer built the bomb and in the end there's conspiracy theories and everything else. Right. Yeah. It's, and I'm a history buff, especially for this time period for World War II. But yeah, I learned a lot from this movie, especially about Oppenheimer's career before the Manhattan Project and then afterwards. Like I knew that he had been head of the Manhattan Project. He had spearheaded the development of the atomic bomb. And then I knew that after the war, he ran afoul of the government. But I didn't really know much of the details and yeah it, it, i learned a lot in this movie about that time period and about physicists and what the physics world was like and really how i mean i suspected this already but how sleazy and awful the government can be <laughs> to people who work shocked. for it shocked. yeah i know <laughs> shocking but it's like politicians you're just, are bad <laughs> yeah it's like at least what? the ones in that movie yeah, and it's, yeah and that how like he he essentially gets dragged like it was so weird like the fact that someone could essentially go through what's essentially a trial in all but name but not before a jury and just before the, this group of people like it just seemed so terrible and not unconstitutional or whatever i'm not a lawyer but i'm just like whoa okay they could actually do this to somebody because he was prominent and because he had a security clearance. Revenge. 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 They, Revenge. they yeah. could essentially ruin your life yeah. Yeah. and destroy your career. And um, I'm like, wow, okay. Yeah, because he made somebody mad. Yeah, for seemingly trivial favorite. reasons. Right. So that, that was, yeah. uh, the way his and Strauss's actual relationship was much more intensely angry oh, <laughs> than it's portrayed in the show. And we should explain, Strauss is Robert Downey Jr.'s character, and he was not a scientist, correct? I was a little bit unclear on that. He, so he grew up actually very similar to Oppenheimer. His uh, parents were German Jewish immigrants that came in around the same time, 1880s, 1890s. The difference between the two of them is that Oppenheimer's parents were successful businessmen and Strauss's were not. And so Oppenheimer was able to fund his continuation in school where Strauss was not. Strauss had to go a different route. And so he didn't get to the high levels of science because he didn't have the funds to do it. And so he there is there's this built in jealousy already when they first meet. And Oppenheimer and it's somewhat portrayed in the movie. He's both very charming and very alluring and has a very charismatic and magnetic personality. And at the same time he he has that doesn't necessarily understand the impact of his words or if he says something in certain tones and he just had these it was a series of I'm gonna call it run-ins but interactions between him and Strauss where Strauss always just felt like he was 
Oppenheimer was looking down on him, was making fun of him. Like the whole selling of the isotopes to Norway incident where Oppenheimer oh, yeah. was basically just tearing Strauss's stuff apart in front of this huge audience. Strauss took that really hard. And then his interactions with Oppenheimer going down the line there, it built up this, I don't like this guy and I want him gone <laughs> in Strauss. Right. And that that's the thing that doesn't really get revealed until the third act of the movie. Yeah. That this whole attempt to strip Oppenheimer after the war of his security clearance, it has been is the part of the machinations of Strauss or as he keeps saying to everybody in the movie, it's straws. It's straws. That's yeah. straws. <laughs> that's that's how he pronounces it. But yeah, like that. And you think like for most of the movie that Robert Downey Jr.'s character was not an enemy of Oppenheimer, but there's this reveal and me not knowing any of the details of that. I was very impressed by that, that they, yeah. that oh, they, they were able to hide that. Yeah, they did it really well. And the way they did it, cause it's, it did play out like that in the hearing, although not quite exactly, but the scientific community knew, like everybody knew like right. this was, this had been a, effectively a political assassination that they had pulled him into this, secret trial thing with no jury to try and steal his access and or his clearance and that it, it was really just a vindictive thing that Strauss was doing to Oppenheimer at the time a lot of it swirled around the development of the heavy the hydrogen bomb yeah. and Oppenheimer's opposition to that and that it, interesting enough they went a very they went Oppenheimer actually had two big reasons he was opposed to the hydrogen bomb one of them is portrayed very well in the movie, and that is the potential for arms race with the Soviet Union. We build something bigger than they're going to build something bigger. And then the balance of terror. Right. Yeah. But interestingly enough, the whole, the whole concept of mad or mutually assured destruction wasn't a thing yet. Right. Because literally when they're in that dining room and Strauss is showing him the spectrometer graph and they've got a bomb now. The the concept of we'll just destroy each other wasn't on the table because at that point America had been building bombs for a while and the Soviets had one, right? So there was this right. there was no thought process that didn't happen until much much later. So the concept of an arms race was still a very new idea, and they didn't have ICBMs yet, right? Intercontinental no. ballistic. Oh no, yeah, they were. <laughs> it was quite a long time. They were flying basically. Eventually, once we got to the mad phase. They had these giant routes that the bombers would fly all the way up to Alaska and around. It was just a continual refueling process. And like you'd have, always have so many of these bombers in the air close enough that you could get to the Russians as fast as they could get to us. It was just, you know, <laughs> honestly, things started to calm down a little bit once people had ICBMs. Because <laughs> <laughs> you weren't running people all over the place constantly. There's less less chance of a catastrophic accident of a plane getting shot down and with its bombs on it. And right. And that. Get, uh... that actually happened where I grew up at an Air Force base. There was a tornado that came through and it hit the Air Force base. I, I saw a video of it hitting places and they had B-1s on the tarmac. This was 91. So it was the end Ooh. of the Cold War. Yeah. And they weren't worried about them going off. They didn't think that would happen, but they were worried that they would get lost. And what would they do? <laughs> nuclear bombs that are just scattered because of a tornado. But I know that they were in a panic for a little while. I suppose that too, the danger with that is that the spreading of radioactive material yeah. over a, a wide area that... <laughs> well, that piece I, or some farmer's going to run it over or something. Or <laughs> Yeah. Ooh. Right, yeah. That's the thing, like, what I love about this movie is that it really communicated well to me like how much into uncharted territory they were going with this stuff and how and i love that scene where he's he's being recruited by general groves and groves is like the nazis have a 12 month head start and he's nope 18 18 yeah they have I'm like, 18 months <laughs> i'm like yeah. like i knew they were ahead i didn't know they were that ahead and i know that their heavy water factory in norway eventually ends up getting blown up and at that point they can never recover from that. And yeah, and the other interesting thing is that they were building the bomb for Germany to bomb Germany. J Japan wasn't even in the equation really yet. 
But Germany exits the war, surrenders before they can use it. So they're like, oh, we still got to use this. We're still in a war with Japan. And yeah, there's that moment in the movie where they're like, Germany surrendered. Are, are we still going to test and use this thing? And that they don't know for a while. There's, there's that question. Yeah, Everything is uncharted territory. There's a lot of opposition within the scientific community at that point. They're like, we beat the Germans. They never made the bomb. We don't need it now. And, and Japan's but, not developing one. Right. And, and they're not developing one. The military was like, we have a new weapon. And it could keep us from having to invade an island that would have been off the charts horrific on both sides of the ball. And so that, I think Oppenheimer could see that. And I think he was hopeful. I think he was really hopeful the test would be enough. Right. But it wasn't publicized. And so it was, yeah. because it wasn't publicized, like they, it wasn't, it wasn't like the Japanese could see, oh, <laughs> like they have this weapon now because it's not like anybody had any equipment looking for this yet. And Oppenheimer sort of changes to, let's hope it would only get used once. Yeah, I like the scene where they're with, I think, some cabinet officials discussing this. And literally, the reason Kyoto doesn't get destroyed is because the one guy went on honeymoon there. Yes. Yeah, he really that, like, liked it. It was really pretty. Yeah, I, I was yeah. just, what struck me in that scene was like, your city, like these are cities filled with hundreds of thousands or millions of people, and those lives are either spared or destroyed based on what a guy with a clipboard and a pen is like scratching cities off the clipboard. I'm like, that, this is insane. That, I'm like, are they stopping to think about the what, what are we actually discussing here? Yeah, <laughs> and that happened. That was the reason Kyoto was crossed off, because the Secretary wow. of State went there on his honeymoon. Is, we're not blowing that place up. <laughs> so we're going with Nagasaki. Yeah, and that's that's the other opposition that Oppenheimer had to the hydrogen bomb is it comes up in that conversation with the Secretary of State and all the generals. It's, it's got to be a military target, but it's got to be big enough that using this bomb will have an effect. But we don't want it to be too small of a military target, like it because of the size of this bomb. And when you think about scaling that up to the hydrogen bomb, everybody was looking at it like, we could never use this. This is not a wartime application bomb. Like you, Its sole purpose is to destroy cities. It doesn't right. do anything else. Like you're, and you're just wiping out civilian population at that point. And that was a, a tactic from a tactical perspective. Like you, you hear occasionally people talk about tactical nuclear weapons. It's not tactical. <laughs> it's not at all. You, there's no tactics right. here. You're just going to wipe a huge piece of the map off the map. And yeah. so Oppenheimer was like, it's not useful as a weapon. It might be useful as a deterrent, but then I'm worried about the arms right. race piece. But it's not mm -hmm. useful as a weapon. And at the time, like when we saw with the fish bowls, dropping the plutonium beads in one bowl and the... Oh, that was me. Yeah. That was how it was. Like we were producing uranium and plutonium in very small quantities. And so the question is, are we going to use this to develop a whole new bomb and test it? And there's that scene where they talk about if we set this thing off wrong, it's going to blow up a whole bunch of plutonium across the landscape and we're going to have to wait right. another six months. Which I believe actually happened at a place called Jackass Flats, right? The place is radioactive because there's plutonium everywhere. Yeah. From... Like that. It was a misfire. <laughs> it like partially went. It was like when the North Koreans sent theirs off, it, it didn't fully explode. It, about a third of it did. And right. the rest of it, it just scattered the material. And one thing that I'm not sure they communicated this really in the movie, but that is that the device, the gadget, the device that they test at Los Alamos is the plutonium device. Mm hmm. It's not the uranium device. Because apparently, I guess they just figured that the uranium device would work that the physics was there, so they didn't need to test it or something like that. Like, what, why didn't they test that to test the implosion device instead? I'm trying to remember, and I think it had to do with materials and size. I think I want to say they had more of a plutonium that they could use to try to do the test with. Oh, they, oh, they didn't want to waste the uranium. Right. Oh, okay. That was yeah. part of it. That scene where they, they set off the gadget and everything leading up to that, 
was so, so I was gripping the armrests of my chair. That was so suspenseful. And the fact that they do it like right after a lightning storm has taken place, they've already lifted the gadget up onto this tower and lightning starts going off and they're like, should we take it down? And they're like, I don't think uh, we don't, can do it. It's I too late. Move like, it. Yeah, <laughs> it's already wired. I don't know. <laughs> that was insane. Yeah. Then that whole scene and the, the bit about where they're taking bell. What are the odds it'll ignite the atmosphere and charge the planet to a burnt out cinder? I love that scene. It's, it's in the trailers. If you've seen the trailers, you've seen it where Groves is, wait, how, what are the odds of this? And he's near zero. Near, near? zero? <laughs> what do you want? I want zero. <laughs> zero, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, and that was, that was a running gag. Like it was mm -hmm. something they had, it had come up very early on, actually prior to the Manhattan Project. It had come up when they started sp splitting atoms. They're like, okay, what would get us to the point where we could actually light the, uh, atmosphere and fire and effectively it's nuclear uh, fusion of the nitrogen atoms and then lots of people did lots and lots of math to prove that it's not possible at all okay <laughs> but there were a couple of guys, i don't want to say fermi was one of them but there were a couple of guys that would just keep harping on it they're like oh we don't blow up the whole atmosphere and just walk out of the room and, <laughs> and, and <laughs> The general, he got he's he got more and more fed up with it as the project went on. He, oh, and, yeah. <laughs> so they did a very good job of portraying that whole what was going on in the background with that sort of joke, the inside of joke with him, that conversation between him and Oppenheimer. But it, it was a, a running gag. I like that this movie is really like a character study of Oppenheimer. And we learn a lot about Oppenheimer's personal life. The fact that, wait, is it true that he almost murdered his university professor? So it wasn't was, a, it wasn't a professor. It was his mentor at the university. Oh, and he did poison his apple. Wow. And the guy, he never ate it. Niels Bohr wasn't involved. That was a contrived I made a, that up. a way to yeah. move the story along effectively. As they show Oppenheimer building his Ocean's Eleven team, he's going around Europe. But <laughs> he did poison the apple. And I guess he told somebody or he told the guy. They were going to press charges. The school was going to kick him out. Uh, Oppenheimer's parents actually flew over from the, the U.S. and pleaded with the dean to let him stay on. And he ended up going into therapy. And he was actually diagnosed with, I don't remember what the terminology was at the time, but it would have been one of the forms of schizophrenia today. Wow. So he had a very dark period where he was dealing with like the world of physics that you walk into and how it works and how that plays in your mind. I really like how Nolan showed that with Oppenheimer. Wasn't there, wasn't it true that he was like really bad in the lab? And he, so he wanted to focus on the theory, but every time he had to work in the lab, he just messed everything up. And that was one of the reasons that he was upset with his mentor because I kept putting him in the lab. Yep. <laughs> That's dead on. He was pretty awful in the lab. <laughs> Which explains why later on he's this administrator at, at Los Alamos. He's the person bringing everybody together, like we've said. He's not in the lab building the bomb. He's supervising everything. Yeah, that was one of his, like, his view of it was, I don't want to be the smartest man in the room. I want to be the dumbest man in the room. And he wasn't dumb. <laughs> like it, That was his oh, goal yeah, right, was to yeah. get all of these people around him who could do this and then he could manage them. Uh, One trait of a good leader is to surround yourself with people that know what they're doing. Every if you're going to be taking on a task like that, you need experts in all these different things. And a good leader can bring all those experts together and help them work together and clear the obstacles. Yeah. What did you guys think of at, at the beginning of the movie, before I forget, where they had all of these strange, almost psychedelic visuals? For the first few minutes of the movie, I was like, OK, what's going on here, Nolan? <laughs> I did get it later when, when they started referring back to those things. Is that was that supposed to show, I wonder, Oppenheimer's mind at work? I, I think so. Visuals? I would say for me, it was. Comforting is not the right word, but. That when you meet somebody and you realize they're similar to you. Yeah, that's what it felt like, because a lot of times when you're dealing with the kind of physics that he was dealing with, that's how your mind processes it. 
it's hard to explain. And I have another cousin who's a nuclear engineer as well. And so we'll, me and Ben will talk about this kind of stuff. And it's funny, like we, we both from that perspective, we can see the beauty of quantum physics and the way nuclear reactors work and how just the waveforms and, and the beauty of it to us is a very like, it's very praiseworthy. It speaks to us of God's presence and just like the majesty of how all of this works, that it works at all and, and how it works. And that to me is that's like when I was watching this, I was like, ah, he's probably at university. <laughs> yeah. And then we get even like deeper into I like that. It's not it's neither a hagiography, nor is it completely trying to tear him down in any way. It's just showing him this is the guy, warts and all. And it leaves it up to the audience to make their own decision. And I like that. Like it, Nolan's respecting his audience. He's not trying to make you judge Oppenheimer like one way or the other. Like from, he, he's, he's not trying to push a, a certain view of Oppenheimer. He's just like, here's the guy. You, you make up your own minds. And I, I thought that was it. So they included a lot of things that in a sort of more hagiographical biography, they just would have cut. Or I, I would argue that he did that to Strauss, though, where oh. Stra Strauss is a bad guy. Oh, Strauss <laughs> is, he is portrayed yeah. as an out and out villain, as yeah. almost like a super villain by the end right. of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Did you guys notice the way they filmed it? It goes back and forth and everything, but when they're talking about the future, they're talking about his, the hearing, all those different things, it's all black and white. But when it talks about everything that's already happened and nothing can be, it seems to me like everything that can't be changed that's already happened is in color. And he has a clear view of that. Whereas everything going forward is up in the air and that's black and white. I was, I'm wondering why they did that. That's interesting, which is the opposite, I think, of the way a lot of people usually think. We think of the past in black and white because yeah. of all the old footage. Right. And so even though they had color film, but it was expensive. So mm -hmm. a lot of the footage back then is black and white. And we think to think we think of modern as in color and the past in black and white. So they reverse that. That's interesting. Yeah, everything that happened when they're all the flashbacks to the communist parties and is where he met his wife and the mistress and all those different things. And all of the Los Alamos stuff was all in color. Everything dealing with Strauss and going forward, it, it's almost like it seemed to me like that's where the future is cloudy. Interesting. Yeah. Or not yeah. set yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's I, I've heard another theory that it's everything that's in black and white is the stuff that's had more license taken with it. And the stuff that is, that's in color is the more well-known or vice versa. Um, I haven't seen the movie enough to really make an analysis of it. But, yeah, I thought that was really interesting how they use that sort of color some places in black and white and others. He seems Oppenheimer seems to have struggled throughout it, like throughout his life with mental health issues, because when his mistress dies, apparently by suicide, although I, I, I feel like the movie heavily implies she was murdered. They did it twice. They show that. it twice. If one time they show it, they don't show anybody there. And then the next time there's like a gloved hand. I saw so, that. Yeah. yeah. So then so it makes you think that. The, the one of the theories that I heard was that she was basically clouding hit what he needed to be doing. So the CIA came in and eliminated the cloud. Yeah, the person her the person who finds her is her father. And prior or after calling the police, but before the police show up, he burns all of her papers. Huh. And so there's a real question mark as to what happened. Because it, all the most of the material that you would look for to see what was going on with her, or if she was in correspondence with somebody, if the, or if there was something Oppenheimer left her or something like that, it's all gone. Yeah, like the theory I was operating under was that I was like, okay, she's a communist. She was clearly trying to fish to see what Oppenheimer was doing out there. And I was wondering, I'm like, okay, did she have a Soviet handler? 
And when she failed to get information out of Oppenheimer, did they just tie up loose ends and do her in? That was my theory. Yeah. But we, oh, we don't know. We don't know. Right? But, it's like, yeah. Did all the people that were in that, they had those couple parties, but it was the communist get togethers or whatever. Were they really tied to the Soviet Union? Just because somebody's, I know the government had their red scare, right? Right. Especially when the arms race took off. Did it automatically mean if somebody was supporting the Communist Party that they were tied to the Soviets? Oh, no. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. I believe the Soviets did at least, they had a mole at Los Alamos, right? They didn't really go into this much in the movie, but I think they did have at least one mole there. But yeah, it's like you could be, there were plenty of communists who had no ties to the Soviet Union and were just communists. Yeah, most, it seems like from what we can tell, most of the American Communist Party members had no direct tie to anybody. Uh, But most American Communist Party groups did. They had at least one, if not two or three who did have some sort of direct tie over to the Soviets. Like Oppenheimer's friend, out. right? That one guy. I can't remember his name, but he's trying to fish around to get Oppenheimer to say what he's doing. And then they said later he, he flew the coup. He, he fled the yeah. States. He, he, he ends up in France, actually. And he just goes underground there. But it's interesting because that whole, that happened. All of that. Oppenheimer effectively... Him and his wife saying, hey, can you take care of the kids for a while for us? And then later on, the guy mentions, hey, I know. So, again, I can't remember the other guy either, but there is another guy in the physics department who can get stuff to the Soviets if you think anything needs to be shared. And then Oppenheimer makes that comment to the it's very much uh, if you ever deal with a counterintelligence officer, don't do what Oppenheimer did. <laughs> because he makes up this lie that. Uh-huh. You can tell it's the most tense scene, I think, in the whole movie. It's one of them. And he makes up this lie about, oh, I heard it through a friend of a friend's because he's trying to protect this friend of his who basically took care of his children for a long time. But and he's trying to get him onto the trail of the other guy and not the intermediate guy. Counterintelligence doesn't work that way. (laughs) Yeah, I, I will admit that part of the movie confused me. Where the back and forth with the counterintelligence officer. I did get lost at that point. I was like, I feel like I would need to watch those scenes a few more times. Yeah. Because there's a lot of names and there's a lot of lies that you had that people are telling that you need to keep track of. And I I feel like that's a feature, not a bug. But still, (laughs) it was hard. I wasn't able to take notes in the movie theaters. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You lose track. Yeah. No, it's and that it and that was one of the things that really came back to bite him in that hearing that the secret hearing that they had was basically you lied to counterintelligence while you were working on the project to protect somebody who was in contact with the Soviets. So that was probably the biggest thing that counted against him in that trial. And that, right. that hurt his case, the quote unquote trial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Witch hunt. Kangaroo. Yeah, yeah I think they call it that. Regardless one. of what was said, I think that outcome was pretty much predicted. Yeah. And good news is that and I don't remember the word they use, but last year that trial, I want to say it was nullified or you could think of it as annulled, basically. They didn't retroactively reinstate Oppenheimer's security clearance, but they acknowledged that this was done completely the wrong way and should never have happened. And so we're just expunging that this ever happened, that this Oppenheimer, this should not have happened. Almost like what the Vatican did with the Galileo trial. Yeah. Where they were like, this should never have happened this way. And we're sorry it happened. They can't do anything about it because it's it's history. But they're admitting that, okay, it should never have gotten to that point. Yeah, it's such a fascinating movie and he's such a fascinating individual. Like I said, you can see he clearly struggles when he's when the girl he's having an affair with, when she dies, he has a breakdown. He goes out into the woods and is just there crumpled up in a fetal position. And Cillian Murphy does a great job. All the actors do a great job, but he is phenomenal as Oppenheimer in this movie. Yeah, they said he lost so much weight to do that. 
just to to have the appearance. Oh, it looks I'm uncannily like it. Do that so yeah. Much. yeah, almost everybody is pretty close. Like, <laughs> like you look at a lot of the photos <laughs> of the generals of Strauss, and uh, you're like, oh, they did a really good job of casting these folks. And even though it's Nolan tends to use the same people, he's used Cillian Murphy a few times, but man, he was like made for this role. It was just terrific. I liked, too, the Oppenheimers back and forth with another character. Oh, what's his name? Teller, the guy who's really for the H-bomb. Yeah, and basically throws him under the bus in the hearing. Oh, that's right. Teller does that. Yeah. And what, what does his wife say? You shook his hand. Yeah. He's like, why'd you do that? His wife thinks that Oppenheimer's letting people walk all over him. And that's interesting because they bring it up in the movie. Is Oppenheimer allowing himself to be martyred because he views it as some kind of penance for making the atomic bomb? What did you guys think of that? They pose that question in the movie, but they never really answer it. It does seem like he feels guilty about it. As soon as that celebration at Los Alamos, when they find out that they dropped the first bomb, he's starting to feel guilty about it. He's seeing, obviously, I don't even think Christopher Nolan or probably the author of the, that book would know if he was seeing visions, but they portray it as him seeing visions of people burned up and all this stuff. So yeah, he felt guilty from day one. And then he's trying to stop it from ever happening again, especially with the heavy. Yeah, I think he felt like he needed some penance, I think. Yeah, I took it as like a both and. I think in a lot of ways he viewed it in that light, but I think he also viewed it as a, if they martyr me for this, and it, it's something that Strauss says later, then they're not going to blame me for Hiroshima. I'm going to be remembered as the father of the A-bomb, but not as the guy who dropped it. I, which is uh, that's the interaction he has with Truman, which... Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Truman comes off really bad in yeah, this movie. Yeah, I was not impressed with that portrayal of Truman. because he, Wow. He's... But I did hear that at some point he called Oppenheimer a crybaby. It may not have been the way that he may not have done it to his face and or in that that manner. That's artistic license, but I did hear that he called Oppenheimer a crybaby for saying, should we have really done this? Yeah, it was in a note. I never want to see that crybaby again that he wrote to one of his secretaries, basically. And that, I feel like I have blood on my hands. That's semi-apocryphal. We're pretty sure that that was an exchange that actually happened, but you got to take Truman into account here. He literally found out about the whole Manhattan Project like two weeks before he had to make the decision. (laughs) yeah he it was so secretive that fdr knew right because he's the president but he wasn't telling anybody else even as sick as he was they weren't telling truman all this stuff and all of a sudden okay now i'm president and i've got to finish this war out and oh now (laughs) this whole other thing (laughs) that i had no clue about right yeah yeah, and I, I like the, there's this thing where they're like the the test needs to happen before the Potsdam conference is another issue that comes up where they're like we need to test this weapon so that Truman can tell Stalin about it at this conference. And then it's funny when they actually do it he's like, so did he tell him and he's not really he's obliquely ref but Stalin I guess at this point would have already known really cuz he had his sources probably I don't know. I'd have to look at that one. I'm not sure how often they were letting people off base at that point. And oh, how... the information may not have gotten back to Russia. Right. It doesn't. I don't think that really happens until he gets out of the war is over and he's able to move around more. Was Russia ever fighting Japan at the very end? Okay. At the very very like a few weeks before Japan surrenders, they invade Manchuria. But it's like at the very last minute. Yeah, because before that, they were, they, their borders were on the front lines with Germany. Yeah, Yeah. and that's where, in fact, they pulled, the Russians pulled troops out of the east, away from Japan, to send more people to fight Germany. That's how confident they were Japan wasn't going to attack them, because Japan was throwing everything it had at the United States. And so, yeah, Russia doesn't come in to the war against Japan until very late. And that's another thing they were worried about. They were worried if they didn't use this thing 
on Japan, then Japan would have ended up the way Korea or Vietnam ended up with kind of a North Japan and a South Japan. But yeah, it's and again, the, the movie lets the audience come to its own conclusions about these decisions. I know my own thoughts about it have evolved over time. And it's yeah, I, I, I just that Nolan respects his audience. It's a very thoughtful movie. Yeah, it doesn't try and tell you this was wrong to think. or this was right. It just this is what happened. And that these were the players and these were who they were. And the focus is very much on Oppenheimer and they get his character right. very right. Some of the people around him, not as much, but uh -huh. the, the biopics about him. So right. <laughs> he's the person you want to get. Wrong. Although his it's interesting. He is in real life. He was a little bit more of a womanizer than he is portrayed in the movie. And he is portrayed as a womanizer in the movie. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not like a super small thing in the movie, but it, it seems to, in the movie, at least in my viewing of it, it seems to stop after he gets married. And that's not uh -huh. really what happened. He, even with his secretary at Los Alamos, he was trying to, or had a relationship there. It was something that continued on. Oh. But it, his wife, her character was dialed back pretty pretty hard from how she was in real life. <laughs> and you might be thinking to yourself, how? <laughs> like, but she... She was a, a very much larger than life sort of a person. She claimed she was German royalty, like a princess of some kind. She was she drank more than she ate. They did show that a little bit. They implied it. Yeah, there's a lot of implication there and that the real life was even more. Yeah. Yeah. You, you get a sense of her character when she stands up to the kangaroo court people in the trial. That was very satisfying to see them finally on the ropes a little bit. Like, in the end, they still get Oppenheimer's security clearance revoked. Nothing anybody did was going to stop that. But it was nice to see them awkward for a while <laughs> instead of dishing it out. Yeah. No, that was a really fun scene. <laughs> that was really enjoyable. Because it starts off with her kind of seeming like she's a little shaky, and then she just left hooks the guy. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's an, another criticism I've heard of the movie, and this touches on what we were just talking about a few minutes ago, was that some people said we didn't get to see what happens to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In fact, th there's even a, a sequence where they're being shown, the Oppenheimer and the other scientists are being shown a slideshow of the aftermath of the atomic bombs, but the audience doesn't see that we see the scientists' facial reactions to it. And they're, they're horrified by it. But the audience doesn't get to see it. And I've seen people complain about that. But I'm like, it would have taken the focus off of Oppenheimer and his dilemma about it. And I think that was supposed to be the true focus of the movie. And I think anybody that's going to see that movie, surely they've seen those images. Yeah. Surely they know the numbers of people that were killed and injured and all the suffering. If you're going to see Oppenheimer, at least what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah. I may not have known how it went down. That's what I went to the movie looking to see was how did this happen? And then we get all the political intrigue and everything that I wasn't expecting too. somebody from Robert's standpoint, you're going to have a much different background of it. I'm sure you learned a lot about it in college. But I think that Christopher Nolan did not need to show that to the audience. We know what's happened. And I would say for, for anyone who wants to learn more about it from like a, the perspective of right after it happened, there was a great book that was written in 1946 just called Hiroshima. And it was written by an American journalist who went to Hiroshima and interviewed survivors in the months after it happened, including several Catholics, including a Jesuit Catholic priest who they were far enough away from ground zero to where they didn't get radiation burns, but they were close enough to it so that their, their church still spontaneously combusted. And they had to escape. And just the narrative, it, it's not done as interviews. It's done as a narr narrative storytelling from several different points of view. From this priest, there's a Protestant minister, and, and several other characters, just ordinary people going about their day in Hiroshima. And you get to, to experience what those moments were like and the weeks afterwards. And it is 
it's horrific reading, especially when people start to get sick from the radiation poisoning. But it's a really good book. It's still in print. I have it in a, a collection of World War II writings. In fact, it was so shocking that the U.S. government tried to have the book banned, a sense tried to stop its publication. Because they were like, we do, I, do we really want <laughs> do people know, like, reading this? <laughs> this is, and yeah. I'm like, okay, so yeah, so the, all the more reason for it to be printed. But yeah. it's a pre, if you want to know the Japanese side of things and what happened to ordinary people in Hiroshima, the book Hiroshima is excellent. Yeah, and you, there's some interviews you can find on YouTube where they interview people who survived. And now like, it's pretty recent, like in the last five years that they're interviewing these people. So they're very old. But they talk about what their experience was. And they're, they were all children, right, when it happened. Yeah. In, in terms of Christopher Nolan movies, how would you guys rank this one? It's a different type of movie than, he, than I'm used to him doing. He oh, does, yeah. He did Batman and Inception, all these different. Batman was comic book and Inception, Tenet, Interstellar. Those are all sci-fi sort of stuff. He has his style. He brought his style to this movie, but this movie is a bio biopic. So I've never seen him do a movie like this before. So it's in its own category, really, of those. Yeah, I'm trying to think. It seems like all of the rest of his stuff is very action oriented. Right. This, There's Dunkirk, yeah. which is historical. Yeah. Oh, OK. But that's still there's still a lot of action that happens in Dunkirk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and it just seems like this was not that, right? This was political intrigue and it was a biopic going into somebody's thinking. And, and yeah, it's I, I think I'd have to agree. It's been its own category. I think as far as biopics go, it's really good. <laughs> oh, yeah. This movie is going to win a ton of awards, I think. And yeah, that was the same. I didn't know what to th it just felt like Christopher Nolan was doing something Different, but also distinctly Christopher Nolan. And I just really enjoyed that. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's my favorite of the movies he's done. In fact, my favorite movies that he's done, some people might put on the lower category. I'm such a Batman fan that I love all three of his Batman movies. But and I really Dunkirk and, and a lot of the other movies that he's done. But yeah, th this one was different, yet also familiar. And I'd like to see more in this genre from him. Yeah, I think most of his movies have a very strong lead male character that is special somehow. Batman, obviously. Inception had the Leo's character, whose like, name I can't remember. Tenant had the one guy, the guy who ends up being the guy <laughs> with all the time manipulation stuff. So it seems to fit in really well because we're talking about something new and very different and very unbroken ground kind of stuff. And the character is Oppenheimer. And he's a very special, different kind of a guy and a hinge point to the whole process happening. I, it's a great line when he meets the general for the first time and he's you know, talking about humble physicists and the general says, I'll let you know if I ever meet one. <laughs> <laughs> and as you think about that, it, there's a lot of politics that occurs in the scientific world. And it, oh, yeah. it was the same back then as it is today. And getting all of those people to work together towards a common goal and to get them to move across the country to the middle of nowhere, depending on, it didn't really matter where they were getting, folks in Chicago were in Chicago. Oak Ridge, Tennessee was literally nowhere. Right. Until they came. Like, so it was Los Alamos. Yeah, and Los Alamos was the same way. And so you get all these people to move out there with their families to just convince all these folks to be involved in this thing. And it takes a certain kind yeah. of a person. Oh, but by the way, you, you mentioned the Chicago thing. I, I had read, I read a biography once of Enrico Fermi, so I knew they were going to meet him there, and I knew about the pile, the sort of nuclear reactor, basically, that they built. But I'm like, was it really safe for them to be putting that under the football field of this? And they're like, oh, we're, we're not using this football field right now. And I'm like, I'm like, it's still like this. It's on this college campus. It's this big radioactive pile of what uranium bricks. But I'm like that is. Yeah, that seemed unsafe. <laughs> graphite bricks with graphite like, like okay. uranium little nuggets or pieces in there at certain places that's that was the whole goal of that experiment was to set up the geometry such that you would get the 
continuous nuclear reaction. But yeah, I love that. So in order to stop the reactions, what they had was a giant bucket of, it was not a giant, but it was a bucket of sand, borated sand. So boron along with Sam hanging above it. That was tied to a rope that came down to where they were. And they had a guy with an ax standing there. And he <laughs> Very would, low tech. He would hit the rope and the bucket would fall down and spill the boron. It would <laughs> stop the reaction because boron eats neutrons like Pac-Man. And t- to this day, they, they called it as Scram Safety Critical Reactor Axe Man. Like the last two <laughs> Axe And to this day, when you shut a nuclear reactor down, you scram it. We still use that terminology, even though we're using control rods and sophisticated Rue Goldberg systems and <laughs> hydraulics and magnets to, to put the rods in and shut the. We still call it a scram. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I just like that they go to see that thing and like they put the Geiger counter in front of it and it's like clicking away. And I'm like, oh boy, I'm like may- maybe back up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That <laughs> yeah, that's coming from some of the scientific community. They didn't like that Fermi didn't play a bigger role Ah, in, yeah. in the movie. And part of it was because they were not in the same facility a lot of the times. But Fermi was extremely important to the project. He's one of those guys, he was smart enough that he, when he needed a formula for something, he wouldn't like go grab a book and read it out of the, he would just re-derive it from whatever base equation continuum of the motion equations. Ah, okay, I got what I need. He was extremely intelligent, but he didn't get very much screen time. And a lot of them are like, well, I mean, he was really important to the project. Yeah, like I, I was listening to another podcast where they were saying this one really important guy didn't even get any lines. The only times you see him, he's in the background playing the bongo. Yes. I forget which scientist that is unfortunately oh but they, they that was his his hobby was to play bongos and so yeah he appears a couple of times when they're setting up the test and he's just doing that and i'm like who is that guy and yeah he never gets any lines but yeah. apparently he was like a serious like member of the team yeah <laughs> and i want to say he ran so he didn't end up taking up the bongos until after when they became popular in like the 60s but it was to let everybody know who was paying attention, who that guy who was. Who that was. Oh. But he was, and I'm, I am totally blanking on his name. Dad Oh, I'll have to look it up later. But yeah, there's, for instance, when they, he goes to ask uh, Albert Einstein about setting the atmosphere on fire, that, that never mm-hmm. happened. It was not a problem. Oh. I don't think Einstein would have really even been interested in it. That's too bad. I liked that scene. It's, it's good. <laughs> they just needed um, to show that he knew him. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it was actually done by a scientist named Compton, but nobody really knows him. And so it's an homage to Einstein being the father of, of a lot of the quantum physics, the general relativity and that, that stuff. And so nobody knows who Compton is, Compton scattering and all that. The stuff I learned <laughs> in college. <laughs> and you're like, ah, oh, we're not going to use him. We'll use Einstein for this one. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's such a dense movie with so many moving parts, so many things going on. What are your guys' final wrap up thoughts about it. I really want to talk about the conspiracy theory at the end when the cabinet member that that is or maybe is a secretary chief no he's chief of staff I think that uh is talking through straws through that hearing for him to be elected as a cabinet member right. and when he gets when they vote him down he's straws like who voted me down he says a young guy from Massachusetts named Kennedy, and they just stop ah. right there. And I'm like, oh, there's Christopher Nolan's conspiracy theory right there. Because that, that was, was almost what... like a, a Marvel name drop. Yeah. Just name drop a character, <laughs> a famous character. Because yeah. that was like 56 or 57. Here it is six, seven years later. We know what happens to that young senator later on. So... There's Mm. Nolan's conspiracy theory. I guess so. I didn't, for whatever reason, that didn't click. As Uh, soon as they did that, I was like, oh my gosh. Just (laughs) like, oh, JFK. He's saying that Strauss was pissed because he's the one that that brought Oppenheimer down. Then he gets, so he did that out of revenge. Yeah. So now he's going to get revenge on Kennedy. (laughs) Interesting. Yeah. A future episode of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it. <laughs> M- maybe this part will end up in the feedback for Jimmy Aiken. You could spin several episodes of Mysterious World out of this movie. The, the, the mis- mystery around 
his his girlfriend's death, the Kennedy thing. Like, yeah, there, there's even just the story of the making of the atomic bomb. Some of my favorite of Jimmy's episodes is where he just goes through a historical thing that we already know mm -hmm. all the answers to, like, like the surrender of Japan. Oh, that, like, was, that great. was fascinating. Yeah, like yeah. The, 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 coup. the coup that happened and stuff. Yeah. And then just like the guy, I love the guy who's like going through the streets on a bicycle, just throwing leaflets saying, don't surrender. That's how desperate <laughs> one point they get. Yeah. Tr truth is often stranger than fiction. And this movie definitely shows that because I was so surprised at some of the things that happen. But yeah, great movie overall. I really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to seeing it again when it comes out on video and stuff and yeah, I just hope Nolan makes more historical movies and more biopics. I think he's really good at it. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to see a... Because this was a biopic about Oppenheimer, and the Manhattan Project was a big part of his life, but it wasn't the only part, right? It was we got from the movie, right? I think anybody was going into to, to that thinking, okay, this is all going to be Los Alamos, and it ends up being a quarter of the movie or so. <laughs> it would be awesome to get a uh, making of the a-bomb like a, a manhattan project movie of, of ah, this kind of a yeah. style i think that would be really cool where you saw all the different facilities and everything doing their parts you could bounce back and forth be like okay where are we at now yeah i would like to see a movie about the destruction of the german heavy water factory because i know that's a really interesting story when it involves parachuting in guys on skis and stuff. And it's, it's, I know they've done it. They did it in a video game recently, but they took so much insane license that apparently it wasn't even the same story anymore. There's floating around in the universe of the world. There are these little cubes, maybe a couple inches across on each side. And it's graphite. It's uranium graphite. And it actually came from like the Germans, the closest they ever got to building like a Chicago pile. And they're not like radioactive or like highly radioactive or anything. And so like they ended up like a couple, some people in the U.S. government have them like on their desks as like paperweights and stuff. Huh. They're from <laughs> this. Wow. Yeah. And, wow. Uh, yeah. So like there, there's stuff like that you learn like about the German nuclear program and like the stuff that sort of just got dispersed after their country was more or less dismantled. Especially the eastern side. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where all that stuff ended, eventually ended up. Yeah, and I think there's a movie to be made, too, about Operation Paperclip and NASA. Oh, yeah. Bringing all those guys back from Germany. And Von Braun, the, yeah. ro the, rocket, the rocket guy, guy who guy. made the V2 rocket, essentially helping to build the Saturn V yeah. and getting us to the moon. It's, it's like we were really good at, because that's my other major aerospace engineering we were really good at blowing up rockets <laughs> until we got the german <laughs> rocket scientists and they were like that's not how you do the fuel <laughs> spacex is still doing that right? they blowing consider up, some of their blow-ups a, a success because they learned something as long you as know. you learn something from it it is a success you learn right. as and when you go to build rockets you're gonna blow up a lot of rockets <laughs> that's just oh, yeah as long as there's not people on top of it when that happens yeah, that's yeah. always the goal. You blow them up before you have people so that when you put people on them, it doesn't blow up. Right. And the, the German V2 was, the, I believe, the first man-made object to enter space. I remember I believe reading that somewhere. on that one? I, I'd never heard that. It didn't yet. orbit the Earth or anything. No, no, no. It just well, exited the atmosphere and then fell back down. Yep. But yeah, there's so many great... That's why I love this time period. Because technology is making such leaps and bounds because of the war. It's all these countries are in high gear trying to make war winning weapons. And so much of what we take for granted nowadays gets pioneered yeah. in World War II, like computers. Or because of, of the arms race that came out of the Manhattan Project, the space program that we have came out of that. Who can launch rockets to the other country faster? That was, that's what the space race was. It wasn't just, oh, look what we can do. It was, look what we can do, guys. Yeah. <laughs> right. What if we, we took the ICBM? We can get our bomb yeah. fast to you faster than you can get yours to us. What if we strapped a guy to that thing instead of a bomb? Right. You think we can get him to the moon? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. 
And I like how they like, I, f- I forget when this got put in place, but eventually most nations in the world signed the Outer Space Treaty. So it's OK, you can't actually put like missile launch platforms like orbiting the Earth or something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it, it, there there was a so-called in, in the 60s, the missile gap, whether the missile gap was actually a thing is still debated, but people believed in it. So it's like it helped fuel the arms race. Yeah. And the whole the concept of having a national lab system like we do today, all of that was born out of the Manhattan Project because there weren't anything like there wasn't anything like that. Prior to that, Los Alamos is still a national lab. Oak Ridge is still a national lab. And then we have so many more these days. There's huge, just government funded research facilities. They do all kinds of crazy experiments. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? That's really cool. Oh, and the one other movie I'd like to see before I forget is a Cuban Missile Crisis movie. Yeah. That would be a nail biter. And Maybe having heard like Jimmy Aiken's podcast as a start. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And I've heard so much from my parents of having lived through that and just the the terror of being under the threat of thermonuclear war and stuff. It would be interesting to see it brought to life in a film cuz what is it we almost accidentally went to nuclear war three times during the Cuban missile crisis. That's I think it was three insane. times in one day, wasn't it? In one day. That was yeah. it. That's pretty insane. So, yeah, that could be Christopher Nolan's next project. I think that might be right up his alley, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> Cuban Missile Crisis. Cuban Missile movie. Crisis. But anyway, yeah, the, that's Oppenheimer. Definitely see the movie, everyone. Although, if you've listened this far into the podcast and you haven't seen it yet, shame on you. You've just been <laughs> spoiled for well, the whole day. movie. <laughs> Although, I, I say that, but I'm a person who normally doesn't care too much about spoilers, but I know other people, really. But, so yeah, before we wrap up here, we'd just like to take a brief moment to thank our patrons who make this program possible, including Alexandra S., Lenka B., Peter M., Captain Natron, and Nora Lynn S., Their generous donations help us to continue to create the secrets of movies and TV shows and all of our shows here at StarQuest, and you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. For our listeners, we have questions for you. What did you think of Oppenheimer? You can let us know by sending us an email at secrets at sqpn.com or by commenting on our Facebook page or on YouTube or on Twitter, and you can visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. But until next time, Patrick Mason, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Oppenheimer. Oh, you're very welcome. This was great. I don't, I don't get to talk nuclear stuff very often, so this was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was awesome. And Jason Yuji, thank you as well. Thanks, guys. I really enjoyed talking with you guys, and I learned so much more now. So, thanks. And once again, I'm Thomas Salerno. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows on Star Quest. Here's another show on the Star Quest Network you're sure to enjoy. The Secrets of Stargate. Find it wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash stargate. We'd like to thank Patrick McCaffrey of Moonshadow Studios for editing this episode. To have your audio edited professionally and with care, check out more of Patrick's work at moonshadowstudios.biz. That's moonshadowstudios.biz. 